Okay. Uh, can everybody hear me? Great. Thank you, Will. So thank you for joining my brother Richard and me and our families this evening to learn Torah Biskut, our father, Charles Sidlow, Yisrael Kolonimus Ben Naftali, Zichrona Livracha. We marked his 42nd yard site yet uh, recently on 9th of Shabbat, and this is the 18th consecutive year we've been able to sponsor learning at Fleetwood Synagogue in his memory. We are, great, we are grateful to Dr. Ronnie Perales, who has agreed to be with us tonight. A note of thanks is also due to Rabbi Rosenfeld and to our Shul president, Joshua Schickman, for helping to coordinate this evening. Our father, let me just share my screen for a second. Our father was born in 1938 in Berlin to parents whose, whose roots were Polish and Ukrainian, but who were born in Austria and ultimately ended up in Germany. Our father was born just 10 months before Kristallnacht. In 1939, just prior to the outbreak of World War II, his parents were somehow able to secure precious exit visas to Chile, and they made their own escape across the Atlantic in the ship Virgilio, seen here in the picture on the bottom right where they landed in Arica, Chile, and eventually joined an expatriate community of European Jewish refugees in Santiago. He grew, up, he grew up in South America, became a chemist, emigrated to the United States in the early 1960s, got married, and finally settled in Los Angeles, where my brother and I were born. In 1980, he died unexpectedly at age 42. Rich had just had his bar mitzvah, and I was 10 years old at the time. In trying to reconstruct a thumbnail character sketch of our father through the hazy gauze of time, a few features remain quite clear. He was a brilliant autodidact and was a Renaissance man. He had an insatiable mind and was constantly reading, studying, and exploring multiple avenues of thought, from science to politics, from art to history. Our uncle, who was the dean of a prominent medical school, says that his brother Charlie was one of the smartest men he ever knew. One of the last recollections I have of my father was that of him spending a long Sunday afternoon alone at a desk, thoroughly immersed in multiple dog-eared textbooks, textbooks as he taught himself to read and write Russian in the original Cyrillic script. Seemingly, this was a normal way to spend a free Sunday afternoon. Our father was also had an incredible love for and memory of music. He could always name that tune in three notes or less. Despite our constant encouragement, he never chose to compete in the game show, which was filmed just a few miles away from our house in Los Angeles. He would certainly have been a champion player. While our father wasn't a yeshiva trained Jew, Rich and I remember his proud and firm connection to Judaism and to our collective history. And we remember how important it was to pass this tradition on to us. Our father taught us to read and write Hebrew, he ensured that Rich and I received a basic Jewish education in a conservative Hebrew school throughout our youth. And he role modeled for us the important Jewish principle of consistency by making sure that we heard a traditional Shabbat Kiddush and experienced a Shabbat family dinner every Friday night. Rich and I are grateful to have absorbed a deep sense of loyalty to Jewish tradition from our father during the very short time he was with us. It is our feeling that our father's memory is best honored through meaningful discourse on themes pertaining to Jews, Judaism, and Israel. We are certain that our father would have enjoyed tonight's presentation. In this spirit, I will ask Joshua to welcome Dr. Perils. Thank you, Rob. Um, I also would like to thank Professor Ryan Perils for joining us tonight and to thank Drs. Rob and Richard Sillow for their ongoing support of this program. Professor Ronnie Perella studied in Israel at Yeshiva HaMiftar, followed by undergraduate studies in Israel at bar Ilan University, where he earned a bachelor's degree in philosophy and comparative literature. Following undergrad, Professor Perella attended graduate school in Spanish literature at NYU. Prior to joining the faculty of Yeshiva University in 2009, Professor Perella taught Spanish and Jewish history at the University of Pennsylvania and was subsequently assistant professor at Brandeis University. Professor Perales is the Chief Rabbi Dr. Isaac Abraham and Jelena Rachel Alkali, Associate Professor of Sephardic Studies at Bernard Rebel Graduate. Ah, oh, that is a mouthful, I'm sorry. At the Bernard Rebel Graduate School of Jewish Studies at Yeshiva University. He also teaches undergraduates at Yeshiva University's Yeshiva College and Stern College for Women. 
and additionally served as director of the Arthur, Arthur Schneier Program for International Affairs. His research explores connections between Iberian and Jewish culture during the medieval and early modern periods. He is the author of Blood and Faith, Family and Identity in the Early Modern, modern Spartac Atlantic. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Dr. Perales. Thank you. Hi, it's wonderful to be here. Um, and uh, such a lovely array of people, family. I can see some of the names, so I can see that they're family members, but it's a you know wonderful amount of people to come out on a on a Saturday night uh, to to go deep and study and explore and, and ask some questions. Um, so I really appreciate it. And it's very meaningful. Uh, it's always wonderful to share uh, what I spend my time studying and teaching daily with people who don't have to take this for credit who are coming because they love Torah, because they love ideas, because they want to expand their world. Um, and I think tonight is especially so after learning a little bit about, about um, uh, Charles Sidlow, that he was himself a, uh, someone who spanned the Atlantic who traveled along with his family. I didn't, re I didn't know this and that he was a person of ideas and, and hunger for knowledge. So really it's uh, really an honor to, 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 to be a part of this. Um, so I, just a, a word to everyone here. Um, I'll be checking in with you once in a while, but if you have questions, a point to clarify, if I didn't say a term that wasn't clear enough, send it into the chat. Um, and if it's somewhat urgent, I'll try to take care of it then, but certainly it's a good way so that when we get to the end, we can, uh, we can, we could, um, um, have those questions there. Um, and if you can make me a co-host and I'll share my, my, uh, PowerPoint, that'd be great. Um, you should be host now. Okay, great. So then, yes, I have it there. All right. Just give me a second. Okay. Okay. All right, so this is, this is a big topic, but I always think it's important to start at the beginning. And where we think is the beginning is always a good question. Um, for me, I'd like to start with Svarad. Uh, this is a term that uh, obviously people hear it and either it means in modern Hebrew, Spanish, Spanish language, the country of Spain, uh, but what's its origin? Where does it come go back to? So the first uh, the first mention of the word Sfarad um, is in Obadiah, the very small, compact book of 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 the Bible of of Obadiah, and we have it here: the Galut Hachel Hazel Livnei Israel Asher Kenanim Ad Sarfat. So there we have one place name. Sarfat, that we normally refer, we use it to talk about France. The Galut Yerushalayim Asher Bisfarad Yarshu et Areha Negev. Okay, so Book of Ovadia is a very apocalyptic book. It talks about the end of days. Um, and it's talking about these exiles. Now, these are exiles who were sent away during the first Kurban, or the, the destruction of the first temple. Um, and they were scattered around the world. And these will come back. And it identifies these two groups. Now, when did Sfarad become Spain? Because we don't have a map. Right? The, the Tanakh doesn't come with a map. We don't know where these places are. Over time, they come to be associated with certain locales. Um, so we, if you look at Unculus, the, the Aramaic translator, uh, ready in, in, this, in about the second century or so, he translates Farad as Aspamia. So that's where, it's, where that connection of Spain, Aspamia, Hispania, um, and Sfarad um, start. And the Jews of Spain, the Jews who lived in Spain for, for hundreds of years, 
claimed this as their identity. They said, we are Sfaradim. We live in a place called Sfarad, and we have ancient roots here. We did not show up yesterday. We did not show up with the Muslim conquest in 711, even if we know that big numbers of Jews arrived in Spain after the Muslim conquest in 711, um, which opened up the country and, and created many opportunities. And that's when the majority numbers wise came. But the Jews of Spain already at a very early point refer to themselves with this term, Galut Yerushalayim Asher Bisfarad. You'll see letters from Chazay ibn Shaprut, uh, Rambam, Yud Levi, referring to themselves as Ani Hakatan Mi Galut Yerushalayim Asher Bisfarad. I am the least of the exiles of Jerusalem that are in Sfarad. And, and I, I, I think it's important to, to think about that phrase for a little bit. It reflects the deep roots the Jews of Spain had in the Iberian Peninsula, right? That they are there from very, very ancient times. They're coming from biblical times, at least in their own mythic self-understanding. And also that they are Galut Yerushalayim. So they are exiles, they are refugees. But what type of refugees? They're the nobility. They're those, they're the upper class that Nebuchadnezzar exiled because he didn't want competition. He didn't want the leadership messing, messing uh, you know, riling up the people. He sent the nobility away. So the Jews of Spain see themselves from a very early point, again, as rooted, as being of noble lineage. Um, and, um, and yet a galut, right? A exile, not in the Holy Land. Something's off, even if we are these noble, rooted people. Um, and you can see this um, this is just uh, one beautiful piece of architecture. This is the Alhambra from Granada. Uh, this is the, the, the palace of the Muslim kings in Granada. The, the lore is that this was the house of Shmuel and Agid, the great statesman and poet. Uh, that's the lore. But guess what? As they say about, you know, the stories of, of Gedolim, they don't say those stories about you. It's heavy. Um, it's heavy. Here, this is a, a very famous um, image from, from one, of the, one of the great synagogues that managed to survive through the years in Spain. The, you can see here, you can see the Hebrew letters throughout um, the maintenance of the, of the Muslim style. Um, and it, it, here's, here's another example of, again, the rootedness of the Jews in Spain. Right. Not only did they did they build these beautiful synagogues, were integrated in life in many ways. Here's another example of this. This is the tomb of Fernando III, who was a great conqueror of Muslim territories during during the Reconquista, the the Christian um, fight to take back territory from the Muslims. And when and this is his tombstone. On on the other side, there's Latin and and Castilian. On this side. You guys can see the letters. There's Arabic on the far side and there's Hebrew here. So the King of Spain, the Christian conqueror um, who's, who was dubbed Fernando the Saint after his conquest, um, still made, it, made a point of saying, I, my kingdom includes all peoples, includes the Muslims that I conquered, includes the Jews who are my servants. Um, and you can see here, um, you know, that, that reflected here. So the Jews in Spain are not an isolated community. They're not a marginalized community. They are deeply rooted in the structure of society. Um, in almost any town in Spain in the medieval period, you would come and you would find the small Jewish community. In some towns, they'd be 10 to 30% of the population. Again, towns. The overall country, they were like America, one or 2% of the country. Uh, but, in a town, but in some towns, like a place like Toledo in the center, which was a major political center, uh, Jews were probably about 30% of the population. And again, not living forced in some small ghetto, but actually living throughout the city, owning property and doing business and, and living their lives. Um, now, I point this out because that rootedness and integration coexisted in a society that was deeply, deeply violent. Um, with a tremendous amount of interreligious tension. Um, this is a good example of how that was kind of imagined aesthetically. 
Um, this is St. James the Morslayer, Santiago Matamoros, who uh, was the patron, is the patron saint of Spain. You go to Compostela in, in the north, that's his, the, the big cathedral there where he's buried. And um, he became a major symbol of the Christian fight against the Muslims. And you see, because in some, in, there's a story where the, the Muslims are, 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 are winning a war, a battle, and out of the sky, he comes on a white horse and slashes down, you can see below here, the Muslim soldiers. Um, and this is just to give you a taste of the fact that, yes, you had a society that was multicultural. There were Muslims, there were Christians, there were Jews, but, and they lived together and they did business together, but they also fought each other and hated each other. And, and there was tensions all, uh, as well. So there's that balance. And, and I'm just gonna spend a little bit of time on one of the darkest moments in this history, in this very fraught history. And again, like I said, this comes at a point when Jews are part of society. They are not uh, thrown to the side. They're not, we don't have a history of violence towards Jews. But in 1391, the summer of 1391, there is a breakdown in royal power. Uh, there's a breakdown in ecclesiastical power. The Archbishop of Seville is, it died. There wasn't a replacement. And in his place, a firebrand preacher who has been agitating for years against the Jews um, riles up a crowd and they start attacking Jews in Seville and the violence and the pillaging spread throughout the entire peninsula. This is a fantastic book by, by Benji Gampel, uh, one of the great scholars of the Jews of Spain. Um, and I highly recommend it for anyone who is interested in studying more about this terrible, terrible moment in Jewish history. Um, and you can see here how the violence spread and it, and it left in its wake thousands and thousands of, of, of dead Jews and thousands and thousands of displaced Jews and thousands of Jews who converted instead of dying, right? And uh, were forcibly converted. And you can see this throughout the country. And you can also get a sense of how the fact that Jews lived everywhere, right? Jews were all over the place. And so the, the casualties of this terrible, of these terrible riots were everywhere. Um, and so that, that leaves a community that was once, obviously it was a unified community. Now it's a fractured community. Now it's a community where people stay Jewish and maybe your brother or your cousin or your aunt or your parents, they converted. And after the dust settles, what happens? What happens in these communities? This is a really um, incredibly confusing, difficult time. The ones who converted had, could not go back to Judaism. Uh, they had to stay Christian, but guess what? They lived in the same houses. Uh, they, they were doing work in the same businesses. Uh, so if my brother converted and I didn't, we would stay in business together, um, right? If we were doing business together before, the only difference is that now, instead of marrying my daughter to someone else in the business uh, who was who Jewish, I would, I would marry her to someone who is Christian. But most probably, because of the way business connections worked, I would probably marry that my daughter off to a fellow person in my business who was probably a converso. So you have Jews, conversos, mixing, still, still doing business together, still living together, still living next to each other. Um, and of those conversos, some eventually within a generation or two become very, become devout Catholics. Some of the greatest um, Catholic thinkers and poets um, have converso origins, someone like St. Teresa of, of, of Avila, the great mystic, St. John of the Cross, the poet. Um, these, these people all had a grandfather who converted. So with living memory, um, you know, just to give you a sense of some of the great, you know, great Catholic thinkers who have converso origins, it wasn't, so that was one direction was you have people who embrace the cross, they embrace Christianity, they become good Christians over time. On the other, on the other extreme, you would have people who, despite living a Christian life, they hold on to Judaism, whatever that might mean, right? For some, that may be very vigorous. It may mean avoiding pork. 
um, keeping Shabbat in secret, observing fast days. For others, maybe it just means a belief. I believe in the God of Moses. I believe in the Torah. I believe that by, by fasting on Yom Kippur, God will save me. Um, and you, you have a whole variety of attitudes. And obviously everyone in the middle, right? People who go in all sorts of directions. But this was confusing. Um, this is a, a fascinating quote. Americo Castro, one of the great Spanish historians of the medieval period, did a lot to expand the lens of what was in Spanish history and, and really put a, a, an important focus on the importance of Jews and Muslims in, in Spanish culture. Um, he finds this, he, he quoted this uh, exchange. All right, so we have this individual, Francisco Cáceres, who left Spain in 1492, but returned and converted to Christianity. Right, so he leaves, this is a guy, this is from 100 years later, but this is a guy who didn't want to convert and went into exile, but it didn't work for him. And a few years later, he comes back to Spain. This was not an uncommon phenomenon. And inquisitors have to interview him. Um, and this is what he says back to them. If the king, our Lord, would command the Christians to become Jewish or otherwise leave his kingdom, some of them would become Jewish and others would leave. Those that would leave, finding themselves lost, would turn Jewish in order to return to their nature. And they would be Christians and would pray as Christians and they would fool the world. They would think that they were Jewish, but on the inside, in their hearts and will, they would be Christians. So he turns the tables on the inquisitors. Right? You, you think it's so strange that I, a Jew, I, I lived as a Jew my whole life, after after converting, I wouldn't hold on to my Judaism. I wouldn't try in my heart to hold on to this faith that was in my blood, that's in my, that's in my, my, my family. Um, and so he turns it on them and says, you know, stop, what a stupid question. <laughs> you know, why? Um, but this kind of confused and mixed attitude was, was difficult for the surrounding culture. Um, the, the majority culture, majority Catholic culture, found the conversos difficult to understand, difficult to, to tolerate and to integrate. What were they? Were they Catholic? Were they Jewish? Well, if they're Catholic, why do they still do business like they did before? Why are they hanging out with other conversos and not marrying us? Well, partially because we don't want them to marry us, right? Um, why, are, why do we find stories of people who keep Shabbat, who circumcise their children, who um, have secret marriage ceremonies after church? You know, when their children get married, they then go home and they do a second marriage. Um, Pesach, all these things. And so the, the Catholic, the, what becomes known as the old Christians, look at the conversos with suspicion and term them new Christians. They say, you're not exactly like us. This is, uh, this is a image of the Alboraike. Um, it, this comes from a pamphlet that, was, that circulated very widely in, in, in two generations after those mass conversions of 1391. So think about it, a generation or two into this, you have the conversos still as a distinct group and you see this anti-converso pamphlet that went out to make fun of the conversos, to criticize the conversos, criticize them for being what you see in this picture. Monstrous hybrids. What are they, right? You, you, see, you can see in the picture, you see the different, every foot is different. Um, it's a horse, but it has ears like a donkey, um, it, this weird tail. Um, the whole thing is a very strange beast. And that's what, they, that's what they were claiming. You know, the conversos, you can't trust them. You don't know what they are. They are like this albaraika. They are this weird hybrid. And if today we celebrate hybridity, we celebrate multiculturalism, in the medieval world, that was scary. That was, that was monstrous. Um, you either were one thing or the other. And so they developed this regime of blood purity. And, 
and it was known as uh, limpieza de sangre, blood purity, or pureza de sangre sometimes, and you have to see different terms. And, and the rules were, if you can't show that four generations back, you have no Jewish or Muslim blood, then you can't join X, Y, or Z group. You can't join this fraternal order. You can't join this college. You can't have this position of power. The real, it was really a way to put the conversos back in the place of Jews, right? Jews in society were tolerated, but they couldn't have power over Christians. Now, what happens once they turn Christian? Well, they could have power over Christians. They could become archbishops. They could become mayors. They could become a uh, general. They can be everything. And this freaked the old Christians out, right? This, this made them very uneasy. How could it be that, two genera that a generation ago, the guy who's now the priest of my, of my church, his grandfather was a rabbi, or his grandfather was, was this Jew that my father had dealings with. It was very, very difficult. So here you see a book of genealogy and blood purity from all four lines of Don Antonio Martinez, eh, I can't do, Zapatera y Parantes, uh, made in the city of Carpio, near Cordova, um, and look at the date, 1722. So you guys can do the math. How many years after the expulsion? Certainly after how many years after 1391. We're dealing with hundreds of years later, people proving that they have no Jewish blood um, so that they can be part of some club, so they can, they can, they can get ahead in society. Um, this was not universally accepted. There were many Spanish Christians who were very angry about this. Um, who, who pushed back in, in many ways, criticized in many ways. In fact, Ferdinand and Isabella were, were, were famously very against these policies, but society has a way of, of, of erecting these, these, uh, these barriers. So another way that the conversos were hemmed in, were, were persecuted, um, was through the Inquisition. The Inquisition was set up specifically to police the religiosity of conversos. It was not about Jews. It was not interested in Jews. Um, it was interested in these converts whose Christianity was suspect, whose Christianity was in peril, who could be easily swayed by the devil because it's in their blood. And they're at, they have this atavistic attachment to Jew Judaism that the light of the grace of the church is not enough to, to, to heal. And so you need something like the Inquisition to check on them, to restrain them, to save them from their errors. And um, so that was the establishment of the Inquisition, which was in 1481, the Spanish Inquisition, specifically to police the conversos. And they found a lot of stuff that, that, was, uh, that was very problematic. They found people practicing Judaism, holding on to Jewish practices all over the country. And um, they would hold these auto de fe's and they would make these, a big deal out of it. Now, the veracity of the inquisitorial process uh, is questionable. This is a huge area of, of scholarly debate. Um, you know, the fact that when you get arrested and accused of something, it's in your interest to confess instead of protesting. So if, you pro if, you, if you're innocent and you keep on protesting, but they have evidence against you, um, then you will end up like these guys, ready to be burnt at the fire um, because you're a recalcitrant heretic. But if you repent and ask for forgiveness, you'll be like these guys with the San walking with the San Benito, the, the kind of, it kind of looks like a talus, right? Um, this, see this garment down here, which would have written on it, your your crimes. And then you would wear that for a year or so until you did your penance, and then you'd start your life again. Losing all, you lost most of your property, but you still have your life. So there was an incentive to confess, which means when someone confesses to keeping Shabbat, how do we know that's true? We don't. You, we have to look at it in the wider context and see the details. And it's, it's, a, it's, what, it's the art of reading inquisitorial cases. Um, 
So the numbers of people who were, uh, who were convicted of, of Judaizing, as the crime was called, right, of keeping up, who keep holding on to Judaism was, um, we don't, we can't really know how many people actually were doing that. But the fact is, in the public imagination, this was a big problem. These conversos could not help themselves. They kept on going back to Judaism. Now we're back in Granada because at the end of 49, at the end of 1491, uh, Ferdinand and Isabella are victorious in their war against the Muslims in Spain. They conquer the last piece of Muslim territory, which was Granada um, in the south. And on January 2nd, 1492, they enter victorious into the palace. They're given the key from the former king and they enter victorious into the palace of, the, of Granada. And it's there that they make some very fateful decisions. They, they sign a contract with a idiosyncratic navigator from Genoa called Christopher Columbus. They also decide that the tensions between, the tensions that were, evolved, that were coming out because of the conversos, the, the problems between the conversos and the rest of the Christians were such that the only solution was to, to expel the Jews so that the conversos would have no one to replenish their Judaism, to no one to encourage them and to inspire them and to literally guide them in their Judaism. If you get rid of the living Jews, then the conversos could move along and assimilate into, culture, into the culture. So that was the argument they made for expelling the Jews. Again, this is a huge area of what exactly was, was the intention, what was really going on, what were they hoping to gain? But the fact is those two things, the expulsion of the Jews and, and, the, and Columbus's project, both happened there in Granada when the Catholic kings were feeling at a, at a you know, really impressive height of victory, a sense that God favored them, that they have a mission in the world. They had a very strong messianic sense of the, their, their purpose, of their kingdom. And so here we have these two expansions. One, a violent expulsion of the Jews out of Spain, and then Columbus, which they really didn't know what was gonna happen, right? Columbus, at the time, who knows what was gonna be, but they both happened there. Um, just, just quickly, I mean, you can get a sense of where the Jews went. Um, France was not a place Jews could go as Jews. There was a small community in the south of France of conversos that were not molested. They were not bothered. Um, but France already, no Jews could go. Italy was a place of a lot where a lot of Jews went. Obviously, the Maghreb, right, Morocco, Algeria. The one of the largest contingent went to the to Eastern Mediterranean, to the Ottoman world, to the Turkey, uh, where they were where they were given favorable status and allowed, you know, the tolerance um, that was normal in the Ottoman world. Um, and so, if you meet a Ladino-speaking Jew, they would be Spanish Jews who made it all the way to the east and settled in in, in the Balkans. Um, and but the biggest group goes to Portugal. Um, at which for a few years is an important safe haven where Jews could be Jews um, until some, some other things which will happen, which we'll talk about. All right, this is an image, striking image. What do you guys see in this image? What do you notice? The guy in the middle is holding his nose. Yeah, so it looks like he's holding his nose, but he's actually uh, genuflecting, I think is the term, right? He's, uh, this is a baptismal font. They're baptizing all these women. This comes from the cathedral in Granada. So these are Muslim women who are coming in hordes to, to, to accept the truth of, of Christianity. At least that's how they're depicted. In actuality, uh, they were promised tolerance after the, the conquest, but within 10 years, they were forcibly converted, which, you know, the way it was. Okay, the world, what is the world in 1492? 
what the world is this? We know of three um, continents, right? Europe, Africa, Asia. Um, there's a whole, but the Americas was not known yet. And it's with Columbus's journey that this entire amazing landmass and, and multitudes of peoples and cultures um, is, is, becomes part of the Western world's world. Um, and that's when we start having, you know, this, this massive waves of, of exploration, of conquest, of colonization. Um, little picture of Columbus. Look what Columbus says. Look how he connects, connects these events. And thus, after having expelled all of the Jews from your kingdoms and possessions in the same month of January, your royal highness has sent me to these parts of the Indies. Right, so Columbus is writing this to the king and queen, and he's saying, what wise kings you are, that after doing this amazing feat of kicking out the Jews, you're sending me on this important mission. So he's linking his mission up with the fate of the Jews and saying, you know, just like that was a brave deed, mine is also. Um, so of course he's writing us at a point where he had nothing to show for his efforts yet. Um, just a little review time-wise. By the way, how much more time-wise, how are we doing? Yeah, go. All right, but just give me a sense, and I, I can I can stretch. I can go further. I mean, we're we're, bu we're budgeted for an hour, but you know. okay. So when did I st I, I just went, so I have a I have about twenty minutes more. Twenty five. Twenty. Perfect. Great. Then we're really in good shape. Good. So here's just a bit of a of a of a, of a timeline, just to kind of some people like timelines, some people like maps, um, some people like neither. Thirteen ninety one is when those terrible riots, which really gives gives impetus to this converso problem. Um, and gives rise to crypto Judaism, otherwise known as Maronism, from the term the word Marano, which is a, a negative term, um, but used throughout by by great Jewish historians before me. Um, crypto Judaism is a little more specific, right? Keeping Judaism in secret. Um, the the Inquisition established 1478. By 1492 is the expulsion of the Jews. And look, by 1570, <laughs> there's an inquisition established in Lima and Mexico City. And, and in a few years, there's gonna be one set up in Cartagena de Indias in, in uh, the, the important port in, uh, in the Caribbean in modern day Colombia. Um, by 1639, we have the last great series of persecutions of crypto Jews um, in South America. Um, both in Mexico and in, and in Lima. Um, and by 1654, though, we have a parallel development, which we're going to talk about at the end, which is the beginning and the expansion of open Jewish communities, open Sephardic communities in the Americas, starting in Brazil and then moving on to Curaçao and, 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 and Suriname and New Amsterdam, Charleston, all these other places, Jamaica. We'll talk about that a little bit at the end. But just to give you a sense, so this is kind of the, the time frame that we're focusing in on now, which is from 1492, um, mostly into the 1580s and 90s, um, which is what we're going to look at today. All right, so let's move on. If there are questions, you can stop me or send them into the chat and we can integrate them. All right, so tonight, when we talk about the um, American scene, you know, who were, who were the conversos who were coming in the wake of Columbus? Um, they weren't Jews. Jews couldn't come, right? At least not legally. If they were Jews, they had to hide their Judaism. Um, most, but we know of conversos coming. First of all, we know there were a few conversos with Columbus. Columbus was very proud of having a, a uh, Luis de Torres, who was a converted Jew who could speak Languages that he hoped would be very useful when he got to meet the great Khan in China. The languages included Arabic, Hebrew, and Chaldean, Aramaic, right? So how that was going to help them talk with the Chinese emperor and the Mongol king is, is you know, it's a really great question, but he, you know, details. But so we know there were Jews who came along, but it's really as the, um, 
as the colonization speeds up and there's it, and the trade develops is when you start to see conversos coming in larger numbers um, and becoming part of not so much the colonization in the sense of, of settling land and things like that, but in terms of the international trade. Um, I wanna just go back to this map for a second. No, one second, sorry. We talked about Portugal. I want to talk about Portugal really briefly, but it's very, very important. Uh, thousands of Jews, tens of thousands of Jews made it to safety to Portugal in 1492. And it was a very impressive um, effort because you had to pay a very high tax to get in. And it was a great example of rich Jews taking care of their poor brethren. Uh, rich Jews sponsored poor Jews to be able to pay to get across. And, and um, it was a massive, massive relocation project. And they were welcome to Portugal because Portugal for a hundred years before 1492 was developing a very robust trade with Africa and inching ever so closely to circumnavigating the Cape of Good Hope and making it to India. So they had this large, sprawling, developing um, overseas trade. They had the sailors for it. They had the rich people who, want, who would put money for it, but who didn't want to have to deal with anything. They didn't have the financiers and the merchants to actually do the business and to keep it going. And they saw the Jews coming in as those people um, to fill that role. And they became known as the men of business, either men of the nation or men of business. That was the term that they were associated with. And they got into every aspect of mercantile culture in Portugal. There were many communities along the, the seam with Spain. In other words, the mountains that separated the countries doing small time trade, small overland trade between Spain and Portugal. And then there were the big ones in Lisbon and Porto importing spices from India, dealing in slaves, dealing in gold, dealing in all the things that were part of the, the, the global trade that was beginning at that time. And in, 15, in 1497, five years after arriving there and already entering these different fields, the King of Portugal is in a very difficult position. His son is set to marry the daughter of Fernand and Isabella, and she refuses to go to a country that's filled with Jews. So she, she demands that he expel his Jews or she's not gonna marry the son. He's not gonna do that. He can't do that. He needs them. Um, you know, Fernand and Isabella had the advantage of having thousands and thousands of conversos who could fill the jobs of the, that the Jews used to have. Portugal didn't have that. So what he did after trying to pressure Jews in very, some really terrible, terrible ways to convert. Um, some examples were they would steal children, can baptize them, and then the parents were stuck and they would have to baptize things, these terrible, terrible things. But that wasn't working in high numbers. So he just converted all the Jews. Poof, forcibly converted them. The mechanics of this is, is, is um, there's a great scholar from Australia, Francois Sawyer, who, who's written a great book about trying to piece together how that happened. It's a complicated story, but the deal that was made was he converted them, but then said the, there was no inquisition for 20 years and the conversos in Portugal managed to bribe the authorities and got another 20 years. So for 40 years, for 40 years in Portugal, the conversos lived like Catholics, but were not, molest, were not investigated or persecuted if they were in secret keeping Judaism, as long as they weren't flagrant about it. As long as they kept it secret, Jews could, could stay there. So for 40 years, the Jews of Spain, the Jews of Spain who moved to Portugal, who now were converts to Catholicism, managed, were able to maintain a, a, a live in secret, a pretty robust Judaism. Something 
And in 1540, when the Inquisition starts in Portugal, ironically, the Inquisition in Spain was kind of sleepy. It was focusing on, on, on Protestants at that point. It was focusing on other things. And you start to see a lot of Portuguese conversos coming to Spain, specifically to Seville. Seville was the main port for the Americas. So these Jews who wanted to stay Jewish, who go to Portugal, who then are forcibly converted, and are part of the Portuguese mercantile class, they now are, 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 filling, are, are crossing the border into Spain, setting themselves up in the important Spanish ports. So Seville, in the Caribbean, they start arriving, they start going to places like Mexico City, which itself is not a port, but is a very major um, a center, Lima, which is a very important port, um, Philippines, and they're, they're complained about by bishops. Bishops are constantly saying, you have so many heretics coming here. How do you let so many heretics come to, the, come to these waters, come to these places? Um, but, but, and so much so that the term Portuguese in a Spanish context, if you call someone Portuguese, the assumption was you're referring to them as a Jew. You're saying you're basically in a negative way calling them Jew, um, which obviously a lot of the Portuguese who weren't converso were very upset about. And even the, you know, but that's, that's the way it went. So the Americas is a place where people who, who were conversos could get away from a few things. They can't get away from the Inquisition. The Inquisition was there. The rules were, very, were, were there. They couldn't be openly Jewish, but they could remake themselves. No one knew them in Havana. No one knew them in Cartagena. No one knew them in the mining region of, 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 of Tasco, um, they could change their name. They're not, they, so that all those stigmas of limpieza de sangre, of, of the blood purity, they can leave them behind. Um, they can also find new opportunities, um, new business opportunities, remake themselves in, in, a, in, a, in a different way. Um, so the Americas, you know, the American dream, so to speak, um, is an old one. And it started in the Caribbean and moved on to Mexico and, in, and into the Andes uh, way before it started in, in North America. Um, and these conversos who at home had all sorts of difficulties looked for opportunities abroad. Um, the other piece to understand here is that these merchant merchants did business with family. Family was an essential link. So it was very common for your son to go work with your brother, right? His uncle um, in his aspect of the business. And you would marry the daughter of your business partner and so on and so forth. So these family connections were essential parts of how these, mercantile, these international mercantile groups functioned. Um, and it also became, for the conversos, a very important way that Jewish knowledge was passed down, was maintained, was developed, uh, was transformed. And there's a third piece. And we're going to see this all play out in the next, in the next few uh, slides. The third piece was the Jews didn't stay in Spain and Portugal, the conversos. Conversos did business with, with, with Jews not conversos, Jews in Italy. They did business with Jews in Morocco. They did business with the semi-open Jews in the south of France. And by the, by the early 17th century, they're doing business with Amsterdam. Open Jews in Amsterdam, who just a generation before were those Portuguese conversos living in Porto or Madrid or the Americas um, and now found the haven in, in Amsterdam. So this is a very complicated network. Um, you have people who are openly Jewish living in the Mediterranean, doing business with con you know, uh, um, um, Christian of converso origins in Spain and Portugal and the Americas. And they're all inter interconnected and, and um, affecting each other in, in really remarkable ways. Okay. So we're going to focus on one family. Um, this is this family is somewhat famous. Famous is um, 
um, famous in the realm of people who study crypto Judaism. They're very famous, um, not very famous outside of that, but uh, it's the Carvajal family um, who were this exact profile. Spanish Jews who moved to Portugal, who eventually, after conversion, start to drift back into Spain, get involved in different aspects of, of, of international trade, and then make it to the Americas um, as part of that. Um, they're famous because their trial produced a tremendous amount of material about this one large interconnected family. One of the members of the family was a governor. Um, so that's exciting. And that tells us, and we have a ton of information on him. And the other, the other famous figure is, is, was a man known as Luis de Carvajal. He himself called himself Jose Lumbroso, Joseph the Enlightened. That was his pen name. Um, and he wrote some of the most fascinating religious writings in the Americas um, in the 16th century. And uh, so you have a, a really interesting dynamic family. Um, this is the, one of the first books written about it um, by Alfonso Toro, a Mexican scholar, interested not because of the Jewish piece, interested as this is part of Mexican history. Um, he wrote this in the 30s originally, this is a reprint. Um, Seymour Liebman, a very important um, scholar of Jews in the Americas and colonial Americas, he translated the writings of Luis de Carvajal, some of them. Um, uh, this is my book. I have two chapters on him, uh, on, on Carvajal. And there are a few others. Miriam Bodian, fabulous scholar, has written a very important essay on Carvajal. Um, and Martin Cohen, whose book, The Martyr, um, is, is really the, the standard classic fabulous work from the 70s, it's still, it's still very important. And Martin Cohen, you should live and be well, still um, a professor at Hebrew Union College. And it's, uh, so this is a little bit about the Carvajals. Here you see the, the Carvajal family tree. Um, this is the governor. This is a statue of Luis de Carvajal y de la Cueva, the governor of the new kingdom of, of Leon, in, which is, like Monterey, um, yeah, Monterey, Mexico, um, up in the north, Tampico, those areas in the, the north close to the, uh, close to the, the border with, uh, with the, the United States. I see there's a question from Esther Langer. Is this about Carvajal? You wanna ask your question? Sorry, by accident. Okay, no problem, no problem. Okay, so this is, you know, he was the first governor of this area. So he gets his, uh, he gets a statue, him on the horse. Um, he gets a little biography also. All right, so this is the area, the new kingdom of Leon up here. He is named the first governor there after a career switch. What do I mean? This is a man, this is a man who started his life as a, a classic Portuguese merchant. Um, he worked in Africa, uh, enslaving missions, sell buying and selling European goods. Um, he um, was in business with another Portuguese converso. He marries the daughter of the Portuguese converso. These are classic patterns of the Portuguese converso merchant class. At some point, after expanding into Caribbean um, business, he spent some time in Mexico fighting wars against the Indians. There was a group of nomadic Indians known as the Chichimecos, um, and he was very, um, he was considered an excellent soldier and a great leader, and from that is able to parlay that into getting this, this position as governor. Um, so here's a guy who really goes transforms himself from talking about making yourself anew in the new world. He goes from being this classic mer merchant to becoming a old Christian, like almost like an old Christian Hidalgo, like an old Christian nobleman. Um, he, 
he leaves behind the world of, mer of, merc of mercantile activity and through the sword and through cunning and through leadership makes it to this pinnacle. The problem is to be successful in settling this territory, he needs his family. And his family is filled with Judaizing conversos. And that is his challenge. So his nephew, he doesn't have children of his own. His nephew, Luis de Carvajal, uh, same name, don't get confused, um, becomes his right-hand man. But Luis de Carvajal hides his Judaism very well from his uncle. Um, but Luis de Carvajal, as he is working side by side with his uncle, doing the things that governors of colonial outposts do, he himself was a devout crypto Jew who was writing fascinating poems, meditations on the mitzvot, all sorts of things. Um, and this is a copy of, this is a picture of the beginning of his notebook. He has a small notebook that has a collection anthology, a religious anthology. He has a spiritual autobiography. He has poems. He has all sorts of things. This is in his letter, in his hand. Now, until 2016, this was lost. In 1932, there was a mysterious scholar who showed up at the archives in Mexico City and stole this notebook. And in 2016, Actually, as my book was coming out, uh, this, this services, it's a, it's a fascinating story. It was written up in the Times. Um, it was a, a, books, a book collector, uh, Leonard Milberg, it was shown this book to purchase. He remembered something fishy about the, about the story, checked it out, looked into it with, author with experts, and then called the FBI because it was stolen, it was the stolen manuscript. It was then returned back to Mexico um, and we, it is digitized at Princeton. So anyone could get onto the Princeton library website and look at it. Um, I'm actually currently with two, two, two friends. Uh, we are working on a translation and a critical edition um, of this and an and, and annotated edition of this amazing, amazing little piece of, of Jewish intellectual writing. Um, you can see here, this is how he starts it. Um, en, I'll read it in Spanish first. En el nombre de Dios, Adonai Tzavaot, Señor de los Ejércitos. That's how I, that's, I mean, we don't know exactly what all those initials mean, but that seems to be what it is. In the name of God, Adonai, it's a Hebrew word, one of the few Hebrew words that we know conversos held on to. Um, um, the, the Lord of Tzevaot, which is a Hebrew word also, obviously, but it's a Hebrew word which he might have known from Mass. It's, it appears in the Mass. Um, the Lord of the hosts, right? The Lord of, of, of the ejércitos. Um, <coughs> and that's how he begins his autobiography, um, which, yeah. And, and here you see it, he calls himself um, Joseph Lumbroso of the Hebrew nation, the Nación Hebreo, of the peregrinos de la Occidental India, um, wanderers of the wanderers of the Western Indies. That's how he identifies himself. So a, a Hebrew of the Hebrew nation and a wanderer of the Western Indies. All right, I want to spend a little time with a question. And the question is, if Jewish books are banned on penalty of death, um, and there are no open Jews, right? There's no synagogues. There are no Batei Midrash. There's no Jews you can ask questions to. How, and this is obviously forbidden, how do you, Keep Judaism. How do you know what to do? Obviously, there's oral tradition. Your parents tell you stuff. They tell you what to do, right? For, for so many people, so much of what they do Jewishly is what they saw their parents do anyways, right? Um, 
But so there's an oral component, which could be very powerful and very important. Um, for Luis de Carvajal, that wasn't enough. He was, a, he was hungry for books. And as we'll see, he had a, a deep belief that, that by connecting directly with the, the Torah, he will get, he will hear the word of God. Um, <coughs> and this, so here in the, in the autobiography, it tells of a very important moment. So he's living in Mexico. He's on a business trip with his father. <coughs> and he go, he's, but he's going on the way back to their, to their, um, to their house in the, in the countryside. And along the way, he had a very important chance meeting. God provided for him a holy Bible, which a priest from those parts sold him for six pesos. Through his diligent reading of the Bible, he came to recognize many of the divine mysteries. Um, Bibles were also hard to come by because after Luther, the church wanted to limit who could read the Bible. And they certainly were going to, you had to at least know Latin, which Luis did know. Luis had a decent education. He went to a Jesuit school, had good Latin. Um, and so he could, at least through this, get his hands on the Latin Bible and read it for, as he says, the divine mysteries. So he goes home and he starts reading until he gets to chapter 17 of Genesis which he reads, and he is struck by the fact that he is not circumcised, but Avram Avinu was, was, was enjoined to do that. And he goes, and as he says, with, he, he goes to the river, and with great zeal and burning desire to be inscribed to the book of life, he cut himself and placed the seal upon his flesh. So he auto-circumcised himself, almost died, uh, <laughs> but lived to tell the, the, lived to tell the tale. And I mean, this story is so interesting on so many levels. It's hard to think he didn't know about circumcision, but for he, in his telling, it was important that he heard the commandment directly from the Torah. And that's what inspired him. And that's what drove him um, to, 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 do the, to do the mitzvah. So again, isolated, far away from a Moel or anyone else. Um, also by circumcising himself, he's really, He's really playing with fire because when he's arrested and they see that he's been circumcised, it's a clear sign that he's been Judaizing. So it's a problem. Um, remember this guy? So look what happened to him in the Americas. He becomes the Indian slayer. We have Indians underneath the horse now. So there's a transformation of the reconquista mentality with the, conquist, with the conquest. Um, and it also has a spiritual component. And this school, this is the second part of the story of Luis de Carvajal. This is a, a monastery where Luis, after his first arrest, is released for penance. He's sent to work to teach Latin at the school, and he becomes, um, he becomes very close to the rector, who gives him access to the library. Now, this monastery was a monastery dedicated to teaching Christianity to the nobles, of the, of the Aztec elites. Um, so the children of the Aztec elites would, would go here, they'd, they'd get a European style education, fascinating place. Um, so Santiago de Tlatelolco, which is now a neighborhood in Mexico City. And Luis was sent there. And it's, this was a very exciting intellectual place, a great library. And Luis finds a very counterintuitive way of getting access to Jewish content in this monastery. Um, I'm gonna go back to this section, we'll go that in a second. So here, this is the rector, and this is what he says about him. An elderly monk, a man of great virtue, he loved Joseph, that was his pen name, and with a special love, he loved not only Joseph, but also all of his people. And since the bloodthirsty wolves, the inquisitors, took away their goods and property. They were left impoverished. Um, but this one from his very own plate and table would give them 
all the days of his life. So this guy was very good to the Carvajal family after their, their first arrest. They lost all their money. They were sent to do penance there and he took care of them. Now, oh, sorry, timer, hold on a second. So look what happens here. He's in this Catholic monastery, but they have a lot of books. He reads Latin so he can read the books, not only the Bible, but commentaries on the Bible. Now in the medieval world, a commentary, you see this when you, you, see this when you read a, a Ramban, right? The Ramban often quotes a large passage and then critiques it or uses it, right? It's a very classic thing you see in the Ramban. You'll see this in, 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 the, in medieval scholarly works. They will quote a long passage and then analyze it. And there were two books in particular that Luis talks about reading that were very important for him. One was Nicholas of Lyra, and the other one was um, Nicholas of Lyra, the, the Oleaster, and, and um, sorry, Yes, I'm sorry, Nichols of Lyra and, and the Oleaster was another, another authority. These two scholars were very interested in rabbinic sources. They were interested in what the rabbi said, Rashi, Midrash, Rambam, and they would quote, and then they would critique it viciously, right? They, they thought they were totally wrong, but they would quote the entire passage. So look what happens with Luis. He described the joy he and Fray Pedro shared when the rector required, acquired the, 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 the gloss of Nicholas of Lyra. Um, he, okay, I didn't, uh, both were overjoyed with the arrival of Nicholas of Lyra's commentary but for different reasons. Um, because for Luis, I'll, I'll translate, he was able to transpose, to translate and to take out of the Latin into Romance, meaning Spanish, many things from the Holy Bible um, and other, other sources. Look at this one. In this book, the Lord revealed for him the Holy 13 principles and fundamentals of our faith and religion, something not known or heard of in these lands of captivity. So here is a, someone who wants to be a Jew, who wants to be a learned Jew, sitting in a monastery, who ends up reading Rambam in this Catholic text. And he does this with many other sources. And he created an anthology of Jewish sources, which he shared with, with, um, with other crypto Jews in, in Mexico at the time. They're saying, I want, to, I want to just go back to another slide for a second. There was another way, there was another way to get access to Jewish knowledge even though Jews were not allowed to come to Spain, uh, to Spain and to Portugal and to Mexico, they still came for all sorts of reasons that we don't know, we don't really understand, generally for economic reasons. They were looking to make some money. So a Jew from Italy would come to Mexico, act like a Catholic, find the conversos, connect with them. They often had family connections. And along the as they were doing business, they would share their knowledge. Imagine you grew up in Ferrara. You went to, you, you had a Jewish education. You knew the tefilot. You could translate them into Spanish for people. You could tell them all sorts of things. You can tell them how to, how to properly salt a chicken. You could tell them how to keep Shabbat. All sorts of knowledge that they wouldn't have had. And we know of several cases where Luis himself talks about them. We have other, other, other evidence of Italian Jews who come to Mexico City on business, hook up with the conversos and share knowledge. And this is a great example of it. This is in Luis's anthology. This is a calendar. What can you see here? Even as Shavuot. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. There's Shavuot, Hanukkah, Tammuz, Tishnam Be'av, which is a very, very Portuguese way of saying Tisha Be'av. 
uh, Rosh Hashanah, Gedalia. Um, this is the day of the week. So it would have been on a Wednesday, which makes sense. Rosh Hashanah that year was on Monday, on Monday, two days. And then this is the this is the the day of the of the month and um, day of the day of the month and this is the month. Here we have a list of Hebrew, Tishrei, Cheshvan, right? And then one to ten down below. It's a little hard to see in the slide. From Echad to 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 Tisha. Again, this is a person who doesn't know any Hebrew. But in this, through this transference of knowledge from Italy, he's able to know the calendar at least for two years. He knows the names of the months that he would not have any access to. He can say the, the say the Hebrew words for these holidays. He doesn't have to use the the way that you know the the um, Catholic form. Um, so these were some of the ways that this that Luis is able to um, to recreate Judaism and to share it with the wider crypto Jewish network. Um, and that's and it's so you see that all the ways that the global roots of trade bring people, bring ideas, bring knowledge back and forth across the Atlantic. Um, and it's this interconnectedness, which is its strength, is also its danger, because ultimately one loose link and the whole thing falls apart. And that's what happened with the Carvajals. Um, one of the sisters was a little overly zealous in talking to a fellow converso who was not interested in Judaism. He reported them to the Inquisition, and then they were arrested for a second time and ultimately um, were martyred in the auto de fe of 1596 in Mexico City. This comes from a mural by, by the great muralist Diego Rivera. This is Mariana de Carvajal, one of the sisters of Carvajal, um, depicted here along with other, other famous figures of, uh, of, of colonial Mexico. Um, so the, the Carvajal story had kind of a, has an afterlife in Mexican culture, um, not only here and other things, there was a movie, there's, there's interest in it, but certainly for Jews, his story resonates on so many levels. And, and I, I really hope when we translate this entire anthology, it will have, you know, uh, it, it'll allow people in a lot of different disciplines to, to explore the, his inner world and get a better sense of this very unique aspect of the Jewish world that we don't normally think of. Um, do we have a little time left or are we, because I, I, a few minutes? Okay, so what do you see here? A bird. It's a bird? Good. What else? What are these? It's a phoenix. Ooh. What makes you think it's a phoenix? Uh, just a connection to the um, Spanish Portuguese Jews. Very good, yes. We'll talk about that. Um, what do you see in the scene here? Looks like a Yaakov and Asaph. Mm hmm right, the Agalot. Um, so this comes from, I'm having a little, oh, there we go, good, fine. This is, this is uh, what's known often as the Ferrara Bible. Um, this is a Spanish translation of, of the Bible, um, as it says here, translated word for word from the Hebrew truth um, by many excellent lettered uh, people, scholars. Um, this was the classic Bible translation for, for, for the Jews of Italy and, and the diaspora. Um, and but here in this in the in that image of the eagle, I, I think of Al Kanfe Nesharim, right? How did God take us out of Egypt on eagles' wings? And so these people who made it to safety in Italy are remarking on the way that God, you know, protected them and took them out of the troubles in Spain. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about just to finish up. So we have the 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 Jews were living under the Inquisition, Jews who had to be in secret. We saw that they're not completely cut off, um, but 
there's a whole other American Jewish story which will develop in the 1600s. Um, and that has to do with the wider Sephardic diaspora. Um, this was a, a wonderful exhibit that Leonard Milberg, the guy who rescued the manuscript uh, put together at the New York Historical Society um, a few years ago. The Phoenix, uh, who, who, who noticed the Phoenix? Uh, exactly, the Spanish Portuguese Jews in Amsterdam chose as their symbol, the communal symbol is the Phoenix, um, the bird which is renewed from its ashes, just like this community. Because the, the community, like I said, were people who were converted forcibly in Portugal, managed to make their way out of Portugal, founded this new community in Amsterdam, and they were given rights and, uh, and, and freedoms that they could not have almost anywhere else in Europe. Look at this incredible synagogue. If you've been to Amsterdam, the, the, the Esnoga is one of the great uh, landmarks in the city. You know, they were able to build this beautiful, beautiful uh, structure. Um, and just another, but this structure was built by the wealth that was generated by international trade. These, these Jews were in finance and in, 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 in uh, mercantile culture, outgrowth of what they did in Portugal, um, bringing in spices and everything else, and, and having satellite communities throughout the Dutch and English uh, co colonial world. Um, in fact, the, the wood for the Arona Kodesh came from Brazil, just to give you a sense of how these things are all interrelated. Um, get a little sense of the, of the culture, right? We have Hebrew because they were able to obviously have schools and teach people, but, but Spanish continued to be, Spanish and Portuguese continue to be the operative languages of the, communi of the community. Wherever there was a Dutch colony, Dutch Sephardim moved there and set themselves up and were an integral part of that colonial world whether it was like here in Curaçao. Um, this, is, this is the Amsterdam Esnoga, the Amsterdam synagogue. Um, and notice the parallels, right? With the way that it is here. Here, it's a different building. It's the Caribbean. That's why they put the sand on the floor so that the sea air doesn't destroy the wood. Um, but it, obviously it looks different. Chandeliers, the, the columns, the way the, the the Teva, the Aron, I'm sorry, the, um, the Bima in, in Ashkenazi, um, you know, is placed, there is all very similar to the Amsterdam model. Again, thinking back to what we began talking about integration, Sephardic play, you know, sense of place in their society. Um, this is a map of, of Curacao and the Yodekirk, meaning the Jewish church, the synagogue is listed as number 19. And that's because it is not behind some small alley. Um, it, is, it is in the center of town in the main strip, just like the Isnoga was in Amsterdam. Again, these are people who could be proud of who they are, who could be open about their Judaism and are an important part of society. Yeah, there's a hand up, yeah. Uh, I saw in another synagogue, I think it was in Jamaica or something, they had sand on the floor as well. And it, I heard it had something to do with like, if you have sand on the floor, then it wouldn't make as much of a sound and you would like not risk being discovered. Is there any parallel to that or is it completely different? I, I, I'm excited to find someone who can do a history of that explanation because I heard that too. I heard it, it's also like, like there's a whole Midrashic piece to it that it's like uh, when the Jews left Egypt and they crossed the Red Sea. I, these are all, I, they're not the reason. Um, I don't know what, you know what I mean? It's an interesting, um, I, they were not persecuted in Jamaica. They were not persecuted in Curacao. They were not persecuted in, in, in Newport. Uh, in Newport, they don't have sand, but they say there's a trap door because if the Inquisition came, there's no Inquisition in these places. Why would they do that? It doesn't, it's a very, uh, I, I, I'm, so I'm curious when those stories developed and how they developed. I'm sure there, there's probably a really interesting history there, why people made those connections and, you know, but basically, it doesn't hold up in my in my estimation. But but I'm but I do think it may reflect 
you know, desire the part of those communities to connect this pretty prosaic custom, right? It's not a religious thing. You put the sand on the floor, like I said, the way it was explained to me in the Caribbean was because the, the humidity and the sea air was very bad for wood. And so this is a good way to protect the sand, to protect the, uh, the floor. Um, <coughs> and you see it in other, other buildings as well. Um, so, but just getting back here just for, uh, for another few minutes, these communities were robust. They produced literature, whether it was, you know, Sidurim, translations of the Bible, commentaries on the Torah, commentary on the mitzvot um, in multiple languages, but, but very often in Spanish and Portuguese. Um, and those books circulated throughout the Americas. Um, Mikveh Israel, this is a whole book uh, written by the great Amsterdam rabbi, Menashe ben Israel. Um, it's a Rembrandt sketch um, of, of Menashe. And he was a great rabbi and a philosopher. And, and that whole book is a study of the origins of the Americans and, um, and the role of Jews in the Americas. Fascinating work. Here we see again, the similar, you see, you see the similar structure. You have the Teva here, right? The, the Bima, the Aron, the way the chandeliers are set up, the way the columns and the seats are. This is in London. This is Bevis Marks um, in London, painted by a Jamaican Jew, Mendes Belisario, one of the great early Jamaican um, artists. He's, he's decorate, you know, he's well known in Jamaica himself. So here we have a British synagogue painted by a Jamaican Jew who comes to England um, on business. Um, and, and this is, so, so throughout, as the crypto Jewish communities in the Americas are either persecuted and really shut down by the Inquisition, um, you have a parallel movement of open Jewish communities throughout the Caribbean in the English and Dutch areas. And that's going to be the kind of the, the, um, the continuation story of, of the, the saga of the crypto Jews. Um, and, and it's a way that Judaism, you know, is rooted in the Americas and continues for, for many generations. Isaac Aboab, the, the first rabbi in Brazil, um, and here we have a little stamp from Brazilian government marking it. Um, and Suriname, this is a the Jewish area in Suriname, the, the Jewish Savannah, this, this is the synagogue, the highest building in the, in the place. Um, and these are these very illustrative um, tombstones from Curacao um, that you, you know. All right, I'll just leave with this one because it gets us to America. Um, this is Charleston. This, this synagogue um, burnt down in a fire, but um, this was, again, the same sort of um, Spanish, port classic Spanish Portuguese structure. This was done by by Carvalho, who has a very similar name to Carvajal, uh, one, a, great, a great American painter. He did a lot of great scenes of the West. He went out West for many years, but he was a member of the synagogue and painted it here. Um, all right, so I, we've done a real tour of, oh, one second, stop sharing. Um, then a tour of a couple hundred years of Jewish history and, and, and a bunch of continents back and forth. And I'm sure you may have questions. So I'm happy to take any questions and, um, and thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think Richie, uh, Richie has a question. And uh, okay. you gotta meet. So does Evie. Oh, okay. They're, they're both in the chat. Oh, okay, let's see. Let's see, sorry. Um, uh, all right, so Phoenix, thank you, Ashira. Yes, so we, 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 we talked about that one, right? Okay, good. Um, to what extent, if any, do you see any acknowledgement or connection of the many evangelical Christians in Colombia and other countries in Central and South America converting Judaism? Conversive history, wow, it's a powerful question. There's a question also about Christopher Columbus. All right. I'll start with Columbus one, it's a little easier. Um, 
or harder. I don't know. There's a lot of mystery about Columbus's origins. Um, he's it's pretty clear he is not of Jewish origins, but again, um, with someone, when someone has mysterious background and there's not a ton of information about him, um, you can posit all sorts of things. Uh, it, I recommend people reading his diaries. You can get them in English. They're really interesting and really weird. Um, and, and I really think, I'm, I'm actually teaching a course right now at, 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 y, at Yeshiva College on not a Jewish history course, a normal history course on, on the New World Encounter where we, read, where we read Columbus very carefully. And it's fascinating. And one of the things you see there, you can understand why people would maybe say he's Jewish. He has a lot of weird ideas that he picked up along the way. He was, an, he was a fascinating autodidact who read widely um, and drew on a lot of different sources. And some, one of the sources he really loved was a 13th century um, a Franciscan myst mystic, Joaquin de Fiore, who, uh, who drew a lot of his ideas from the Kabbalah. So through Fiore, Columbus is drawing on Kabbalistic ideas that someone else would come along and say, oh, he's, maybe he's Jewish. Well, okay, was, was Fiore Jewish? No, he's a Christian. He used Kabbalah for his own reasons and, and, and his own way. He's very, uh, it seems pretty clear that Columbus is, is a pretty devout Catholic, but a weird Catholic, a very idiosyncratic Catholic um, with a lot of interesting messianic ideas. Um, and so, yeah, so I think that's, that's, um, that's what I would say. And I encourage you to read his own stuff though. But there are people who have argued that but you know, uh, I don't. The question about the evangelical stuff, there's an, and there's a whole other piece, which is all throughout South America, and a lot of people are familiar with, with the crypto Jews of, of the north of the Southwest. Um, that you know, these are people who in the last hundred years or so were able to embrace Judaism openly. That they come from this 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 crypto Jewish background, uh, but throughout the Americas, there are communities of people who are organizing themselves, embracing Judaism, like full on. They are 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 pious, dedicated Jews who are you know who live a Jewish life in places like like Medellin, Colombia, you know where it, there's there's a tiny Jewish community. Who doesn't really want to do anything, have anything to do with these these people because they're very different socioeconomically and, and and from all sorts of different angles, and it's fascinating. And sometimes those communities say that they're that they have converso origins, but often they don't, and often they come to Judaism via evangelical Christianity. Um, it's fascinating. It's something I don't know enough to understand yet. And I'm, but I know it's going to be a very large problem because it's fascinating. And these people are serious Jews, um, you know, undergoing tremendous sacrifice to keep to keep halacha as best they can, and to study. And um, there, there's some really wonderful people involved in this. So that's a whole other. But it's interesting because they often will not cite a converso piece, a converso origin, and then sometimes it kind of comes up in the identity, you know, kind of identity, identity for formation, I think, and a way of rooting themselves in, in a larger Jewish story. Um, but, but I think it's, you know, it's complicated. But in terms of evangelicals, if they have, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, that'd be really interesting. I, I, the, the thing that I think a lot of, part of the reason why the success of evangelical uh, Christianity in, in South America, partially, it's only part of it, is, um, kind of, there's a there's antagonism to the Catholic Church, right? History of abuses, the materialism of the church, the abuses in the church, corruption in the church, the way the church is often um, seen and identified uh, with corrupt uh, political leaders, and so the evangelical church is kind of this great alternative, um, and and that explains a little bit of its of its appeal, but also that that direct relationship with the Bible, you hear that in, in Carvajal, and that's why some people see some of what Carvajal is doing as almost like a, a par, like a Protestant move of some sort, like wanting to connect directly to, to the Torah directly without, you know, intermediaries. Um, yeah, there are a bunch of more questions. 
Um, I think Yechiel, Yechiel is asking about shuls in Mumbai, not souls. In Mumbai. Yeah, that's a, an audio. Well, they're souls too. Uh, shuls in Mumbai and Kachin both look similar. Oh, okay. Um, I'd have to see them. I don't know if those, are, you know, I, I'd have to see them. I don't know. Um, there, there were there were connections between Jews in Amsterdam, Portuguese Jews in Amsterdam, who've traveled to India on business, um, and and there's there's a, there's a really interesting letter of a Portuguese businessman who went there and he talks about it. So there might have been some sort of uh, transference. I'm not sure. Okay, that's a great this, number two is a great question. When right, the Inquisition is is abolished in 1825 or so. Yeah, wrap your head around that one. 1825, it's a long time. Um, but it's, it, and it's around that time that Jews from those island communities like Curaçao and Jamaica start going to the coastal cities in Venezuela and Colombia and Costa Rica. Um, and they start doing business. And some of them set up shop there. And some of them set up a small community, even though, the, even though there's no inquisition, it wasn't legal to be, uh, to be Jewish. But it's the Caribbean and people are relaxed about certain things. Um, and so in, in, in parts of Venezuela in Coro, which is a little town um, on the coast, there was a small community, but they assimilated very, very quickly into the wider Catholic um, environment. Um, you know, in Panama, the, the amount of Jewish cabinet members or presidents or, or people with Jewish origins is very high. Um, and there's all these people who are from Curaçao, or from Jamaica, who went to, went to Panama, founded the first community there. I see some people nodding. Do we have some Panameños here? Um, anyways, it, it, it's a fascinating phenomenon um, in these places where you know, these outsiders who were insiders at the same time managed to uh, become very successful very quickly and kind of blended in uh, to the communities there. Um, um, what am I, I'm missing something, There's something else? Okay. Oh, wow. Oh, I don't know. Shira, your question. Um, I don't know. There's a wonderful activist, writer. Um, uh, her name is Ginny Milgram. Ginny Milgram, uh, based in Miami. Um, she wrote a book called My 15 Grandmothers. Um, an amazing story. She basically did her genealogy. And on her mother's side, 15 generations, all converso. She could trace herself back to the baptism. It's insane. Um, and so, um, you know, her story is very rare. A story like that is really rare, but it's fascinating. You can look up her book. It's, it's, you can find it on, on Amazon, very crazy. She's great. Um, yes, a real hero. I agree. And, and I'm really excited for people to learn more about him. So I'm happy to share um, more about Carvajal Lumbroso. Um, and, um, I know that the Sidwells take advantage of this, but I'll, I'll point it, I'll throw it out there. You all can come and audit our courses at Revel. Um, they're mostly at night or late in the afternoon. And now there's always a Zoom option, thanks to um, COVID kicking us into the 21st century. So um, you can come and learn more about all sorts of great stuff at, at, at Revel and it's really easy and you know to do as an auditor. So um, I really, and I just wanna say, I, I really, this has been so nice. I just wish we were in person and we can schmooze and, and, and drink a glass of tea together, but um, that'll come. It's nice to see some, some old friends here um, and, uh, and, and now some new ones. So, um, and you can always email me if you have questions or whatever about the stuff, if you want book recommendations um, to go deeper into something. Yeah. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was really wonderful. No, oh, thank you guys. Thank you very much. Real honor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Excellent. Rebecca, Thank goodbye. you. Bye. So oh, wonderful. Good to see you, Rebecca. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.
tío. Hola. Unmute, unmute yourself.